So under the EFF government, there won't be IEB examinations. All metric learners will have to sit for the same examinations, uh, Commissioner. Yeah, definitely, Titus. Uh, we totally agree with it. There must not be a distinction oh. of learners in society. If mm -hmm. we are under the same educational system, it means learners must write the same exam and the mm -hmm. results must come out the same way or at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But private schools will still be there? Yes. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. And one one thing that is also interesting is that parents who do not take their kids to school will be criminalized. Talk us through that. Um, yes, uh, you know, early childhood development is very oh. important. It's a ECD. very critical, yes, ECD is very critical. It is a foundation phase of a child, of a background, educational background of a child. And therefore, it means if the government or parents do not um, take it serious, mm -hmm. uh, it has an impact of delaying a child when they have to enter into the other, the senior phase mm -hmm. of education. So criminalizing parents who do not take their children to school is definitely one of the things that the EFF will do because um, what the EFF commits to is to ensuring that all children have got access mm -hmm. um, to early childhood development programs. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's going to be compulsory that every child must be admitted and they must be at school yeah. during school times. Already, 2024 doesn't look good for students. NFS uh, is set to cut uh, its budget by mm -hmm. 10%. In fact, National Treasury is set to cut uh, its budget allocation to NFS by 10%. This must be a huge blow. Yeah, it's it's bad. It's 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 really tragic because with the budget that was there before, students were still victims of financial exclusion in institutions. Now with the budget cut, it means more students are going to be financially excluded. You are sending potential um, contributors to the economy back to the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, it's going to be a crisis on top of the crisis that we, a pandemic, in fact, of sending mm -hmm. young people back home and on the streets to say we are closing doors to education for you. Yeah. Comrades, we must pay people according to their qualifications. <laughs> and we understand that <laughs> under the EFF government, uh, all unemployed graduates um, will receive a basic uh, income grant. Um, so the intention or what is believed for you to come back home with is to come and better the standards at home. Mm -hmm, um, that is the expectation as well that they have back at home. So you cannot go to school, become a graduate, and with good grades, a majority oh, yes. of our students mm -hmm. pass with good grades. Mm -hmm. But because of the lack of access to jobs or the limitation of jobs in this country, mm -hmm. the government needs to somehow meet young people halfway. And I think that is why the EFF has committed to giving the unemployment stipend, mm -hmm. uh, graduate stipends, to appreciate the work that the graduates have put in, the efforts that the graduates have put in, but also to assist them to not, re to not say all hope is lost. Mm -hmm. uh, you must still be able to go back home and put something on the table. And therefore, we agree uh, with the manifesto of the EFF that says unemployed graduates mm -hmm. must be given a stipend to show gratitude of the time and of the efforts that they've put in mm -hmm. to bettering the status of the country. Stand up, South Africa! Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me! Run, South Africa! Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a COVID thing. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the people of South Africa, Africa and the world, it is not doom and gloom under the EFF uh, government. My name is Titus Tungu. I bring you the Swicks episode of the EFF uh, podcast. And joining me today is uh, the EFF uh, MP Commissar uh, Sharon Litlape to help us understand, to get a sense of the EFF uh, manifesto. We will continue bringing you uh, episodes that seek to dissect the EFF manifesto and make it make sense of it all. Now, she's here with me. Great honor to have you with us, uh, Commissar. Uh, and thank welcome. you very much. Thank you very much, Titus, for having me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now let's get into the nuts and bolts of the EFF manifesto. We understand that the EFF is revolutionizing uh, education as a tool uh, 
uh, in the hands of uh, the poor to ensure that there's access uh, to free, of course, and decolonized uh, education. Perhaps if we can and try and understand or unpack what does decolonized uh, education mean? How does it really look like? Um, decolonized education is an education system that does not seek to produce or reproduce um, servants, mm -hmm. but rather it looks at producing people who are going to actively contribute to the economy mm -hmm. and who are going to give meaningful contributions to the economy. And the current education system is not uh, succeeding with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the current curriculum, uh, it teaches learners or students to become employers more than mm -hmm. employees, more than employers. And decolonized education also means that you do not have to succumb to the European uh, standards oh. of education. So it means the curriculum needs to change. You need young people or learners must be taught about their history, about literature. And that mm -hmm. is why the EFF also proposes that African literature must be included in the curriculum. And why? Because you cannot want to go out and learn about standards of other countries, of European countries, without, not know without knowing um, the history mm -hmm. of where you come from. Mm -hmm. Because then it means you will not be able to envision um, where you are going as a country without having to have laid a solid foundation or a better understanding of where we come from. And this is why there is a particular future or vision of where South Africa wants to be. Mm -hmm. So decolonization is that. Um, the education system of the apartheid um, era mm -hmm. uh, really crippled mm -hmm. us, particularly black people in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to be something that we invest in as the EFF. When we say we want to give free quality, not just decolonized education, mm -hmm. quality education, mm -hmm. but quality cannot be limited to the standards of what other countries outside the African continent think education is. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to set our own standards, um, our own standards in a sense that we have first have to start looking at the African history um, and teaching our young people about the history of the EFF, I mean, the, the history of, of the country, mm -hmm. of the black history, so that they do not also shrink their minds and brains and education and the ability mm -hmm. to say, if it's not done by a European country, then it is not legit. Mm -hmm. We must be able to legitimize the African history mm -hmm. at the level of uh, ECD at the level of basic education, at the level of higher education. Mm -hmm. So that is what decolonized education is. means that you should be able to acquire knowledge and not at a particular standard, but at a standard where you first need to feel comfortable mm -hmm. with explaining and understanding where you come from so mm -hmm. that when you go out and compete in the global space, uh, you do so with a better understanding of what kind of education you have engaged or you have uh, submitted to. Mm -hmm. So that is the decolonized education that the EFF speaks about. Yeah. Does mm -hmm. that also include the, the, the history subject being compulsory and, uh, of course, mathematics, not math literacy being compulsory? Yeah, definitely. I think the curriculum needs to, when you draft or when you put together a curriculum, you need to have engaged into what is needed. Mm -hmm at that time or in the coming years oh, yes. in the country so that you do not teach wrong things. And wrong things in the sense that you are going to teach geography when there is a high need of mathematicians and scientists in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And therefore you, con you, you continue See. to produce what is yeah. not needed in the country. Yeah. And so when you say you are going to make history compulsory, you are not teaching children about Hitler. Teach them about the black leaders the black leaders that liberated South Africa, mm -hmm. the black leaders that fought for democracy, mm -hmm. the black leaders in the African continent that fought for the, in the independence of black people in, in, in the world mm -hmm. so that they know that there are actually black people and black leaders that they look up to and they see where the progress has been, where the black people started and where black people are currently and also to see where the need mm -hmm. of them uh, maybe continuing with education mm -hmm. comes from to say uh, you need to continue this battle because it was not started here. 
It started a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But when you continuously teach people, uh, children about Hitler, mm -hmm. uh, you are continuing to crush their minds because mm -hmm. every time they look at a white person, they will see a, a most powerful person oh, yeah. uh, because no one is telling them about the successful stories of black leaders mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm. So that is decolonized education. Yeah. And uh -huh. not this thing of being taught about uh, low caste and its parts because <laughs> somehow what are you going to do with what do you do knowing with, that? with the What do you do with it? Uh, mm -hmm. Mass literacy, it's just another way of really wanting to limit the capacity mm -hmm. of, of children. Yeah. Um, expose them to mathematics because when they leave school, they are exposed to mathematics and they don't know where to start because they do not have a background of it. They don't have a foundation of it. But more of that is also because there is no resources as well. Uh, a lot of schools um, have no resources. They don't have labs and all of that. So it's also very difficult to expose them to that. They don't know what it means to put together certain chemicals. They don't know mm -hmm. how to uh, put together a medicine. They have to meet that at their first year in university, if they make it yeah. inside the institution of higher yeah. learning. Sophisticated stuff. Mm. Yeah. Now, that, that sounds like a quality education indeed. And, of course, this mm. is all about the EFF's plan of action when it comes to the education sector. Now, take us back to your uh, student activism. I understand that you grew through the ranks of the EFF, uh, Student Command, mm. until where you are right now. Uh, you're an MP and also a member in the CCT, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at your participation in student politics. Fees must fall. You were there. Now, the dynamics have changed. Uh, we have new challenges uh, confronting uh, the student community. Let's look at your role that you played throughout your student activism. Would you say Aluta Continua? Yeah, Aluta Continua because, uh, you know, when Fees Must Fall started in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, most of students did not know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. They didn't know that they were starting a revolution until someone had to say to them, you are actually starting a revolution. Uh, we were merely wanting to address uh, some of the issues that we feel need to be addressed in the different institutions. And we then somehow organized ourselves from different institutions to mm -hmm. say, let's do this at once. And so that the voice becomes louder and it comes with more weight. Mm -hmm. um, but in the middle of that, we realized that we started a revolution that was last ended in 1976. Mm -hmm. Uh, we took off from that because in 1976, the dynamic, dynamics change. Mm -hmm. Generation, each generation has its own mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the mission of, 20, of, 20, of 2015 mm -hmm. was to ensure that you do not leave any student outside on the street mm -hmm. due to financial exclusion, due to academic exclusion, mm -hmm. due to victimization mm -hmm. of the institution. And you look at the current conditions now, I would honestly say that it has not changed. Mm -hmm. um, every year, students must be at the gates, fight for uh, access to education. They have to fight to be registered into the institution. They have to fight for their academic records and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say really um, there has been any improvement. Uh, you look at the same thing. You, As activists ourselves, you even get tempted to go and be at the gate yourself yeah. because you know what students are going through. You wonder to say, after so much that has been put in, after so much fights, uh, why do students until today find themselves in the same situations that we left the institution? Mm. Uh, it's almost 10 years now. It's, it's going to 10 years now and students are still fighting for accommodation. They're still fighting for academic exclusion. They're still fighting for academic exclusion, financial exclusion. Uh, so the dynamics really do not change. What changes is years. Mm -hmm. uh, but the sad part is that the generations that come after us, they still have to face what we fought before we left. Mm -hmm. So definitely Aluta Continua. And I think the issue of um, 
young people, the issue of students fighting for access to higher education is not a fight for students alone. Mm-hmm. Um, we made a call to say our parents need to come on board because it goes beyond just access to education. It then says if you get financially assisted in the institution, it also eases off the burden at home. Mm-hmm. Your parent is a cleaner somewhere. She cannot afford school fees. She cannot afford to even give you 500 rand at the time. 500 was a lot of money mm-hmm. for groceries. You can't get that. You rely entirely on NSFAS. That takes you from pillar to post. So with the inflations going up, with unemployment going up, you can just imagine the background of the current students that are fighting for access to higher education, that are fighting for uh, funding in higher mm-hmm. education, where they are currently as we speak. So the fight of fees must fall, uh, continues. It's free education now, uh, but it is definitely a fight for everyone, for workers, for those who are back at home unemployed, for everyone, churches, because you need to be able to put together those who are most influential in our societies. Uh, one way or the other, they have to come to the picket lines uh, to fight and hold hands with these young people who mm-hmm. are merely just fighting for access to education mm-hmm. to better their lives and their families' lives. Yeah, and in 2015, when the Fees Must Fall uh, protests started, the EFF's presence in universities and institutions of higher learning was not as um, uh, visible as it is now. Now the EFF has gained ground in many institutions mm. of higher learning. But in the le- latter part of the conversation, we're going to... Uh, uh, understand what is the EFF's plan of action in uh, uh, the education sector and also how is the EFF presence in those institutions mm. uh, crucial. Now, I want us to look at the EFF manifesto when it talks about early childhood development. Mm-hmm. We understand that parents who do not take their kids uh, to school, if they don't enroll their three-year-olds uh, they are going to be in trouble. That will be a criminal offense. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Uh, you, as I said earlier, Titus, that early childhood development programs are very important because they play a huge role into the development of a child. And that is why the EFF says a child from three years and older must have access uh, to the early development, to the early child development program for mm-hmm. free. Uh, no one must pay, and therefore that is why it becomes p- compulsory for parents mm-hmm. to ensure that their children get admitted mm-hmm. in those programs. And why are we doing that? So that when they get to the phase, the foundation phase of your grade ones and all of that, they are already equipped. You do not start by teaching a child their name mm-hmm. and where they live and what their gender is and all of that. They had already gone through that. Mm -hmm. And that is the purpose of early childhood uh, development programs Mm -hmm. to assist the foundation phase uh, in grooming these young children. Uh, You know, that's what early childhood development program Mm -hmm. seeks to achieve, uh, to work on the basic basics of what a three year, a four year old child should be able to do on their own, how to respond. They should be able to react to certain things in terms of understanding. Mm -hmm. And that is why I'm saying it's a very critical foundation phase Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of work has to be put in there. But on top of that, early childhood development program plays a pivotal role as well in terms of nutrition. Uh, We know when you look at the stats and the studies now, you find that a lot of children under five years They are malnutritioned. They do not get proper food. Mm -hmm. And nutrition is important as well in part of the development of a child. Okay. What you eat, what the child consumes is also very important. So you are what you eat. You are what you eat. And it's it's not a joke. Mm -hmm. And that is why it also contributes a lot to the development of the brain as well. Um, So that is why the EFF in its manifesto commits to say there's going to be a proper and consistent quality nutritious programs in these early childhood development programs Mm -hmm. to ensure that they get meals twice a day, proper meals twice a day. Uh, We also know, I think the EFF also appreciate the fact that uh, in the households where these children come from as well, there is a serious fight of hunger. So the minute they leave uh, the school, 
they have to go back and face the hunger back at home. So it's also trying to close that gap to say, you can't just eat healthy at, at, at school and mm-hmm. once a meal, mm-hmm. uh, one meal a day. So if you have two meals a day, it means even when you get home, you would have at least consumed enough for a day that a person should intake for the development of the child, for the development of the brain. Uh, so that is what the ECD programs are. The EFF also commits to getting professional teachers uh, to be part and to participate in the ECD programs. Mm-hmm. They're going to pay them full time. Uh, they're going to get their pensions uh, contributed by the government as well. And they're going to be permanent. And they're going to be permanent. Mm-hmm. So it means it's not going to be a temporary thing where today a teacher is available, tomorrow she's not yeah. in because she does not have transport money. Uh, it shows the important the importance of this phase mm-hmm. um, in part of the education system. Mm-hmm. You've got all these phases. You've got ECD, you've got basic education, you've got higher education. But each of them have got a role, a very important role, that contributes to the next, that contributes to the other phase. And that is why it's important to invest in all of them, particularly this one, as it then shapes, it has a way of shaping mm-hmm. those who are going to enter into the next phase of education. Mm-hmm. And the education system, or when we look at uh, early childhood development mm-hmm. in its current form, is beset with a lot of challenges. A mm-hmm. um, lot of children cannot read for meaning. What sort of uh, curriculum will the EFF uh, introduce for ECDs? Um so the ECD program uh, under the EFF government is going mm-hmm. to ensure that a child is able to, is going to uh, include reading, storytelling, oh, okay. um, counting, mm-hmm. you know, so that, and also teaching children how to respond and to be understanding of their surroundings as well. So when you say a child cannot read, uh, we must also be cautious of what is it that the child can read and mm-hmm. which language can the child cannot read? Because when you say a child can read, there was a, a study that said children in grade four cannot read and write. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when you look at it, you actually get to pick up that they cannot read and write English. But you look oh. at the background, oh, yeah. where they come from, uh-huh. the schools that they come from, uh, dictates that the child must not be able to read and write English because of the quality of teachers that they have, because of the environment that they have the kind of buildings that uh, they are being taught in. So in ECD programs in under the EFF government, they will ensure that a child uh, goes through all these stages to understanding what does it mean to be outside? What is outside? What do you do when you are outside? What do you get to be confronted with when you are outside as compared to when you are indoors? Uh, storytelling. And that storytelling also comes in in part of African literature as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we are going to be very emphatic on mm-hmm. um, African literature mm-hmm. uh, when we invest in our children's reading and writing. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that is uh, the programs that are going to be included in the ECD uh, programs under the EFF government. Mm-hmm. And when you look at uh, basic education, it's not spared from uh, mm-hmm. challenges of uh, inequalities, uh, inadequ- inadequate access to, you know, proper um, uh, sanitation and infrastructure. Mm-hmm. A lot of, there are still uh, children who learn under a tree yeah. in this day and age. Mm-hmm. There are schools that are mud schools in this day and age. How will the EFF government uh, improve the conditions of schools, as it were? You know, uh, Titus, the apartheid government or Mm -hmm. era Mm -hmm. has left a lot. And I think the minute the EFF gets into government is going to have to redress a lot of things because the current government has not attempted to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the Eastern Cape alone, because Eastern Cape is the most rural province, Mm -hmm. uh, you have about 400 schools that are still mud schools. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the infrastructure or the kind of buildings that are there as well in the other schools that would consider schools, uh, they are not very securing buildings that you would find or you would feel comfortable in your child uh, 
learning into under such uh, uh, situations. Mm -hmm. But the reality of the matter is that a lot of public schools have been abandoned by the government, mm -hmm. um, particularly those in rural areas. Uh, the inequalities are happening, but they are mostly in urban areas where there's still issues of racism that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And I think part of forcing uh, public schools in their different quartiles to write examinations and get uh, results um, at the same time is also part of addressing that. The inequalities uh, of capacity and inequalities of proximity mm -hmm. and the inequalities of access to money because those who are in better schools uh, will then have to get more positive impacts and outcomes and would have to get priority over the other ones. Now, in terms of infrastructure, it's bad. It is. I absolutely. think country-wise, uh, public schools uh, portray a very bad and saddening picture of what a black child, because unfortunately these schools have to cater for black children. Uh, these are the schools that take many and many uh, children in classrooms. You find a classroom with 70 uh, children mm -hmm. in it with one teacher, which means the interaction, the one-on-one -on -one interaction that the curriculum of the EFF would want to achieve is not there. A teacher, you would sit in a classroom for a whole week and a teacher will not notice you. Even when you are absent, a teacher will not notice you because there's too many of children. Overcrowding. Yes, it's overcrowding. Mm -hmm. And I think it is. it comes back also to infrastructure. There are no classes. There are no enough classes. Uh, you have rightfully stated that children still study mm -hmm. or learn under trees. Mm -hmm. And when you go back to those areas, people, parents, and those children feel that that is the best they can get. So it also plays with the psychology of these mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. to say, this is where, this is what I deserve. Mm -hmm. And this is where it ends. My chapter of life ends here. There's no hope uh, for parents to say, my child can live a better life than I did. And that is why the government is also very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And some of our people also don't feel the need to fight for that to say my child our children are, are learning under a tree mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be like that even after it has been put in properly in the constitution to say that every child has a right to basic education mm -hmm. and basic education comes uh, with a package mm -hmm. to with proper infrastructure yes. with sanitation conducive environment, conducive environment. Mm -hmm. so the current status of public schools now in the country is really painful. And I think the government of the EFF um, is going to be very loud uh, on redressing mm -hmm. what our people are going through now. Mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure is bad. There's still schools that don't have electricity. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and mind you, some of these schools, uh, Commissar, mm -hmm were built by our parents. Yes. Were built by communities. Yes. Government only came through just to formalize education, but the infrastructure, the math schools that we're talking about, the buildings, were set up by the community. So why, one wonders why is the government failing to just erect even mobile classrooms, even to build one block mm. and to address the issue of overcrowding? And, you know, our parents building these mad schools were out of desperation mm -hmm. to say, I want my child to get education. Mm -hmm. If it means I have to build the school myself, I'll do so. Mm -hmm. um, now, the government currently has not invested in education, and I don't think it has any interest in, in investing in education. Uh, they have other things that they're focusing on, but education is not part of it. Mm -hmm. And that is why EFF confidently does... Um, say it out to say, but the government mm -hmm. is not looking at investing in education or in the system of mm -hmm. education. Because if it had, if the government of today had a vision mm -hmm. of what kind of country it wants to see under its leadership mm -hmm. in the next 10, 15, 30 years, they would have done that. There is money there. There is money put aside for, 
for basic education. Mm -hmm. And some of these monies, they even get returned oh, yeah, to treasury, treasury. Yeah, uh, yeah. because of underspending. And one would wonder, what is it that convinces government mm -hmm. or a department mm -hmm. that you do not need to spend when mm -hmm. there's still so many things that needs to be addressed mm -hmm. in terms of basic education? Mm -hmm. uh, children, if they are in a structure... Mm -hmm. Leave alone the mobile classrooms because if you request for a classroom, a mobile classroom after a school has been burned or has been collapsed due mm -hmm. to natural disasters, mm -hmm. it takes years mm -hmm. for just a mobile clinic to be delivered in those schools. Mm -hmm. um, so even if they're in a structure, it's difficult to find children in proper desks and, 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 and chairs uh, properly uh, organized in the class to show that Indeed, what they are coming to get on that day mm -hmm. is something that they will have to, you know, hold on to. Mm -hmm. So it's always an issue of survival, even at school. You must arrive early at school to get a chair or to get a oh, desk, yeah, yeah. you know. So children also have to learn to survive from a very early age because mm -hmm. the failure of the current government um, and the hopelessness of our parents and their parents in the different Mm -hmm. communities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then earlier on you touched on the issue of uh, equality when it comes to mm -hmm. the examinations that metric learners write yeah obviously the education system in its current form uh, there will be those who will be writing um, the national senior certificate exams and those who are writing the ieb mm -hmm. how are we going to go about addressing uh, the status quo when it comes to the exams that are being written by metric Um, We're going to have to put in a lot of effort in mm -hmm. that and invest a lot in that mm -hmm. because exam time is very is critical times mm -hmm. for, for learners. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a make or break session mm -hmm. for them. And therefore it means that you are going to have to become as explicit as you can and explicit mm -hmm. in a sense that, like I said earlier, mm -hmm. um, if you are all going to have to write exams at the same time and results be released at the same time, mm -hmm. it means resources and the distribution of resources, the access to resources must be the same. Mm -hmm. um, the national certificate uh, via, uh, uh, vice versa, the mm -hmm. IEB, IEB yeah. um, because the reality is that those who write the IEB examinations mm -hmm. are more resourceful than these other ones. Mm -hmm. So that is why I'm saying you are trying to cut out that distinction mm -hmm. between who has resources and who doesn't. Yes. And therefore the EFF government will have to equally distribute resources, equally distribute access or availability of uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. to prepare and assist these children to prepare for their examinations mm -hmm. so that no one then says, I was disadvantaged because yes. of this, I was disadvantaged because of this, mm -hmm. and therefore it had a negative impact in me writing exams mm -hmm. and ultimately in the results of the exams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there won't be any excuse. If you look at the 2023 uh, metric results, IEB, again, it's leading the pack. Yeah. Uh, with over um, 98%. Mm -hmm. how, how is the EFF government going to ensure that uh, if we don't surpass, we almost equalize the pass rate that is beyond uh, 90%? You know, I think they have to. They ought to get better results because th there's nothing they don't have. Uh, these schools have got laboratories, they, they've got labs, mm -hmm. they've, got, they've got everything. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to have to ensure that we, if not equalize or get mm -hmm. onto the equation yes. of those results, or if maybe better them, mm -hmm. um, we are going to have to avail these resources and facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, because... You can't write an exam of something that you have not seen. Mm -hmm. You can read it on the textbook, but if it has to come with the practicals of it, mm -hmm. you need to have seen it, you need to have done it mm -hmm. to better understand even the effects of it. So examination, you would usually, when you write an exam mm -hmm. uh, in maybe physics, mm -hmm. you would have to go, have gone through the textbooks, 
understand the theory part of it mm -hmm. and have to understand the practical part of it. What is physics and how does it work? Mm -hmm. And in most times, you're going to need facilities for that. You're going to need technology for that. Uh, and that is what a lot over 6,000 students, uh, I mean schools, public schools, do not have access to. So the EFF is going to have a, a program that ensures that proper schools are built because mm -hmm. you need a conducive environment for you to understand or for you to be able to, you know, intake enough information mm -hmm. uh, to be able to go to an exam room and expand your understanding on whatever subject that you're doing. So mm -hmm. the first, the access to facilities, the EFF is going to build labs. Mm -hmm. um, the EFF is going to build computer labs as well. The EFF wants to get to a point where tablets are being uh, distributed to each learner mm -hmm. with the study materials in, uh, with internet access, with all the technological uh, materials or study material that you would need mm -hmm. um, to ensure that these learners, they've got almost everything to assist them in understanding what they have to go and write about. So hence I'm saying there's going to be no excuse mm. of a learner getting into an exam room and say, I did not understand this based on this. There's also going to be tutorials as well uh, because there are other learners that understand slower or faster than others mm -hmm. and that needs to be considered as well. And that is why you need to be able to make available tutorials. Mm -hmm. They need more time than others. They need one-on-one -on -one sessions. And in those tablets, there's going to be those sessions mm -hmm. that are going to at least take them through in an extra time than they do in a classroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when it comes to redress, the EFF has got a multifaceted approach. Uh, obviously, the EFF wants to uh, nationalize and create a state bank mm -hmm. which will also see teachers you know having access to buying new cars uh, the CIC always <laughs> refers to his former teacher yeah. uh, who is unable to by the way mm -hmm. get access to a car and one would imagine the impact that will have the psychological impact that will have yeah. on the teacher they will be always demoralized because their conditions don't improve therefore the output will be compromised as well that affects the quality of the education they will be delivering. So the EFF government surely is also going to take care of teachers. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. In the, the manifesto of the EFF, mm -hmm. we commit to have a Teachers Matter campaign mm -hmm. uh, where the government will invest in the well-being of the teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, what, that's the mistake that usually is done uh, to teachers where you expect them, because you're getting paid, just do your job. And you also don't realize the impact, the negative impact that comes with a teacher waking up in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, not being able to give their child transport money. Because when you get paid, how much do you get paid uh, with the living conditions also that we are faced with? So a teacher leaves home with her own frustrations, with his own frustrations, financial frustrations, emotional frustrations. Mm -hmm. And when they get to school as well, the only thing that they will be doing is to transfer all those frustrations to the children. Mm -hmm. And that means we are not going to be able to get the quality uh, of education that we want. Mm -hmm. And that is why the EFF commits to the Teachers Matter campaign uh, that is going to ensure that teachers get counseling as well. Mm -hmm. Same as children need counseling because of the backgrounds that they come from. Teachers also go through the same thing. They need to be counseled. They need to be taught how to use money wisely. They need to be taught how to be emotionally matured. Mm -hmm. um, if you look now, a lot of the teachers that are in the public schools or that are getting into the space of teaching mm -hmm. is very young people. And that means you are going to have to take them through step by step. Mm -hmm. uh, a person who has never seen 30,000 rand with their eyes, once they get it, uh, the first thing they want to do is to go buy a polo. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the first <laughs> yeah. thing they want to do is to go live mm -hmm. in a flat in town or something. Mm -hmm. um, but someone needs to be an, if, uh, to play an if, an advisory role uh, mm -hmm. to say uh, this is what you need to do as a young teacher or mm -hmm. as an old teacher as well, because we mm -hmm. still do need them. They play a very important role. Old teachers, mm -hmm. um, be able to have someone that a teacher can also 
see as backup to say, if I'm going through a lot, I can easily just say, I'm not fine today. I need to speak to someone. Um, so that once they step into the classroom, mm -hmm. they become what they need to be. Mm -hmm. They become what is expected of them. Mm -hmm. uh, once a teacher steps into a classroom, they're expected to be role models. Mm -hmm. They're expected to be that one person that the child looks up to. Mm -hmm. But if they come in with burdens of back home, burdens of not being able to afford a car, uh, and you have this position or you've got this title mm -hmm. of a teacher or of a principal, mm -hmm. but you can't do mere things that that title must come with, um, then affects children negatively in classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I think that is why the EFF wants to invest a lot in the well-being of teachers, because we believe that once we have sorted out the well-being of teachers, it means our children are now in safe hands. And we can genuinely say that our children are in safe hands because they will then be able to transfer the knowledge of financial education, of emotional well-being to children inside a classroom. A teacher will be able to pick up when a child comes from an abusive family, when a child is bothered by something, you will be able to pay more attention individually to children in class. Mm -hmm. But that also means that you would also uh, make sure that you have enough classes, classrooms, you have enough teachers, so that a classroom must have at least a minimum of 20 mm -hmm. to be able to have an interaction with each child so that you know and you become and you have this relationship with this child mm -hmm. um, so that you are also able to pick up um, some of the things that would hinder with the education of this child inside a classroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the governing party gives metric, uh, those who have passed metric 350, uh, including those that uh, have graduated, the whole graduates, people with PhDs, pe people with masters, uh, do not have jobs. Mm. They are jobless. And uh, obviously that is contributing to uh, the problems of unemployment, inequalities, yeah. and of course poverty in South Africa. Now, how is the EFF going to um, mm. alleviate the situation. We understand that the CIC has already said that we must pay people according to their qualifications. Mm. And those who, of course, may not be um, you know, on the good side of the economy, those who are not employed, are going to at least get a stipend. I think uh, it's a joke, really, mm -hmm. um, for a government that has been in government for 30 years now mm -hmm. to opt for an amount that is way below the living uh, standards of the country. Um, if you go and have to go and get basics mm. in the grocery store. Food is expensive. Yes. yes. Food is very expensive. Petrol too. Everything is expensive, but for a government to opt for 350 uh, for its people, it's a sign of a government that has uh, accepted uh, their exit and they've accepted that they have failed the people of the country. And I think even those who get those 350s should take them knowing that the 350s come from a government that has accepted its failures mm -hmm. uh, as a government. Because, Titus, if you look at the current conditions now of everyone and the inflation rates, all of the things that is expected to, to come in with money. Mm. Uh, 350 cannot even buy maize meal, oil, salt, sugar, uh, tea. It's way beyond 350. I mean, those small things. And I'm saying small You can only have a meal packets. for one day with 350. Exactly. And that is, you are speaking out of privilege, right? Look at a person who will have to buy a 5 kg a five kg of milli, milli meal and have to last for a whole month. And in with that, you must still be clean uh, because you want to have hope every day. So the people, if you go to the pay points, the Sasa pay points, and you look at the people who get those 350s, mm -hmm. it's disheartening. It's really disheartening for our people, especially young people. It's worse for graduates. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you do not eat 350 for a month in an institution of higher learning. Mm -hmm. But you graduate and you must go and find a way of coping with it. Um, so I really think it's a sign of a government that says, we don't care about you. You are on your own. You are on your own and mm -hmm. we are not going to be part of your sob story to say you cannot afford. And looking at that, you also look at the reduction of employment. There's jobs that are being cut every day. You look at your mines, your Englo, your Sibanye, all of them. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are reducing people. And they start with old people because they want to cut on the pensions, on the packages that they take home. But now when you look at that, these are the only people who are left in families or in the different households to take care or to put bread and butter on the table because young people don't have jobs. So even when you cut that 60-year-old, it means that now there's no breadwinner at home. Now that family is all on their own. Mm -hmm. So young people in particular, majority of them are young people who get these grants. I think really they need to take a stance. Mm -hmm. um, not appreciate the little that the government is giving them. Because if you look at the quality of life that the constitution promises its people, it comes nothing close to what they are getting now. And if the government can spit on a constitution like that in how they treat its people, then it's a problem. The EFF says graduates must get what is deserving of them, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you've got people who've got diplomas, you've got people who have degrees, they've got masters, they've got PhDs. Obviously, their standard of living is not going to be the same. Oh, yes, and you are also spitting on the efforts of young people. For a person to go and study until PhD, that person can be a lecturer, that person can oh, be yes. anything, right? Can be a head of research, you know, and all of that. And you say this person must must survive on 350 because you have no intention it's of insult. creating. It's an insult. It's a total insult. Not to that person particularly, but to the academic space as well. Because you have so many people who go into the academic space. When they come out, you treat them as if they have not invested their knowledge mm -hmm. on anything. Mm -hmm. And these are the same people who are supposed to be coming into the space, who are supposed to be assisting government in shaping the future of government. So if you are not able to, to at least uh, provide for these ones, how are you going to do so for those who are unemployed, who have not been able to finish school because of the different reasons that would be? Uh, it's bad. It's really bad for this current government. It's bad for our people that they still look at the ANC government and think there's anything better that is going to come out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is that it's done. This is the end for it. Mm -hmm. And they have shown us for all these years that they've got no intention of bettering the lives of black people mm -hmm. um, in this country. But they also have no intentions of implementing what they have committed to the people through a constitution. Um, you know, so... The EFF government really, I think it's, it plays a huge role in the commitments to open, to somehow open eyes to the people of South Africa to say, we are not only committing to these things, we are committing to things that you had to have, you ought to have by now. Mm -hmm. So the EFF is not promising things that are outside. They are promising things that were supposed to have been provided already. And that is why they see it as an easy thing to implement them. Because if they were in the constitution, it means even the money must speak to the commitments of the constitution. Mm -hmm. And the money is there. So if the money is there, but the commitments and the rights of the people are not being provided for, then where does the money go? It goes to the pockets of those who are already at the center of the economy in terms of intake. Mm. The money goes to the same people. It rotates in the same circle while the majority of our people are struggling, particularly young people in this instance. Mm. 
it's too bad. Yeah. And the EFF's presence is felt across the length and breadth of uh, South Africa mm-hmm. in all the institutions of uh, higher learning. And the EFF Student Command mm-hmm. is preaching the gospel of um, the mother body, the EFF, that is championing the class struggle, mm-hmm. that there must be uh, expropriation of land without compensation and the nationalization of banks, uh, the ownership of the means of production. And that's where the jobs are going to come, come from. from. This mm-hmm. is where... Uh, uh, redress, real redress will come from because 2024 is our 1994. Definitely. Now, when you look at the presence of the EFF Student Command in those institutions, how are we able to revolutionize education and be able to uh, take care of students? Um, I think the EFF Students Command has been doing very well, exceptionally well. Mm-hmm. Um, since the inception of the EFF Students Command, mm-hmm. you can see progress. You can see where one generation leaves and where one the next generation takes off. Mm-hmm. And it's a beautiful growth to watch because this is a student wing of the EFF that has taken or that has made commitments as well to students to say, we are going to do what our, mad- our mother body does, mm-hmm. but at a higher education level. Mm-hmm. And they are doing exceptionally well. I mean... There is no campus um, of the EFF Students Command where the EFF Students Command governs and there are issues of registrations. Um, Unless there is financial exclusion, which sometimes goes beyond the control of the Students Command. Mm -hmm. Because one thing that you must also remember is that when you are in SRC, there's somewhere where um, your authority also ends. Um, And... So these students, they try by all means to absorb as many uh, students as possible Mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that these students get accommodation. And they also go to an extent of fighting for them to be admitted and to be funded by Mm NSFAS. So the Students' Command is playing a really important role where you even see parents coming up to the Students' Command to get assistance. Uh, You know, you don't even say... No, go to your peers and get assistance. Parents themselves uh, pick up arms and say, we are going to ask for assistance from our children because Mm -hmm. they see capacity and they appreciate the work Mm -hmm. that the EFF Students Command is doing in institutions. It's really doing a great job. It's fighting for students to be registered. It's fighting for students to be unblocked. It's fighting for students to have conducive environments. Um... But I think the big enemy of the Students' Command is NSS. Oh, yes. um, it's really a big enemy to the EFF Students' Command because in as much as you would fight for academic access, if you don't have funding, it becomes a problem. Uh, the institutions have declared themselves to be enemies a long time ago of students. And therefore, it then becomes difficult for EFF Students' Command to champion such things of funding if NSFAS is not coming to the party or if the institutions themselves do not come to their party. Institutions have got reserves, by the way. Mm -hmm. Some of them have got trusts. But they are not willing to meet the students, and not just the students' command. Um, You know, they call for a lot of things in institutions, but the response they get from students is amazing. It's great. Because you will find ordinary students being the ones that are on the picket lines, uh, defending their own leaders because students command leaders get victimized in institutions of higher learning for merely just fighting for students to be um, given access to education, to funding and all of that. Mm -hmm. So the students command has really taken up a baton from the EFF to ensuring that whilst you fight for nationalization of mines, nationalization of land, nationalization of banks, Mm -hmm. we will fight this battle, which once you win with the battle of nationalizing all these things that are going to contribute to the economy and stabilization of the economy of the country, we will have then consolidated this side. Because once they win this side, the intake of institutions is going to be very easy. If you have a state-owned bank, the money is going to rotate in the state. 
The reason why today we are being told there's no money is because they have to go and get approval from elsewhere. Mm. And not by those who are in government, but mm -hmm. b by those who they have uh, pleaded for this democracy that they speak about so much. Mm -hmm. um, so the government can't pronounce free education if the Rupert doesn't pronounce free education mm -hmm. or if they, they don't give them approval to say you can give them free education. And we know they will not do that because then becomes a big threat to the white monopoly capital. Um, majority of black students, of black learners, cannot have so much access to education because then it becomes a threat to the current economic system that they have created for mm -hmm. themselves. So that it becomes beneficial to themselves and it continues to suppress those who are poor becomes poorer, those who are rich become richer. And the fiscus, when you look at the 2024 mm -hmm. uh, budget, a large chunk of the budget mm -hmm. goes to debts, goes to loans mm -hmm. instead of uh, economic growth, uh, uh, you know, initiatives. You, know, you look at NFSAS, the Treasury has proposed a 10% uh, budget mm -hmm. cut uh, to NFSAS, and that obviously will exacerbate the challenges of access to accommodation, mm -hmm. payments of uh, allow student uh, allowances. Now, when you look at the EFF's uh, plan of action on NFSAS, clearly the NFSAS uh, funding model should be overhauled. Yeah, um, the problem with NSFAS is when you want to put in a middle person, right? So an NSFAS wants to be treated or it's treated mm -hmm. like a middle person, uh, like a broker. And that is why it's also so difficult to, you know, administer it. Now, the EFF's position on NSFAS is that NSFAS cannot be treated like a broker. It's a loan on its own, mm -hmm. which means the minute you sign a contract with NSFAS, you are indebted to it mm -hmm. and not to the state. The reality is that that money is not going to go back to the state. It goes back to its owners, which is definitely not the state. So the reason why they will not let you go, even if you pass with distinction, they will still want their money is because the owners of that money wants it back. And, gov and the EFF government then says... NSFAS must be administered by the state, mm -hmm. rightfully so, mm -hmm. because the money would have came from the state-owned bank. And they will know that whatever money that comes out, mm -hmm. the impact that is going to have on the growth of the economy, the same bank is going to be the beneficiary of the positive impact of producing uh, graduates, of producing uh, people who are going to be employed of producing people who are going to start businesses mm -hmm. and continue to grow the economic cycle mm -hmm. of the state. Mm -hmm. So the NSFAS current position and how it's being administered is a total flop. And it ought, it ought to exclude more students because it has no intention of growing the pie. Mm -hmm. um, the reduction of 10% is going to be worse. Uh, next year, you are going to find more than half of the current students who are inside the institutions, outside of the system. 87,000, that is. Because they, they, they've got no plan. There's no backup plan. There's no way the way they're getting money from. There's no way where they want to invest money from to say, this is going to be money, particularly for mm -hmm. institutions of higher learning. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst, the Minister of Education is the most arrogant person. Uh, Blayden Zimande. Blayden Zimande is the most arrogant person who has got no interest of black people uh, improving in this country, who has got no interest in this state absorbing black young people mm -hmm. uh, in the economy. So NSFAS is going to be, I, I honestly think that the EFF, once the EFF gets into power, NSFAS is going to be or play a role that it had to play mm -hmm. for the longest time. Mm -hmm. What the role of the NSFAS was for it to fund and to allow people or young people to be absorbed into the economy after they finish studying, mm -hmm. which is the total opposite now. Uh, you graduate, the institution does not even give you your certificate. Mm -hmm. Because you owe the institution. Mm -hmm. How does an unemployed person owe the state? 
Mm. You can't say a young person owns the state. You, how do you own the state when you are unemployed? And then when you come on the other side of the door, they give you 350. They now recognize you as an unemployed person. The fact that you are in the institution of higher learning does not mean that you are going to have access to any money coming from anywhere, mm -hmm. especially when you are indebted to them. Mm. Another thorny issue when it comes to uh, Blade's uh, approach mm. when it comes to the issue of NFSAS, he proposed that there should be um, uh, 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 certain qualifications that should be funded mm. by NFSAS, meaning that there are qualifications that may not receive uh, funding. That does obviously will increase the, the, the pressure that is on students. I understand uh, we once said, uh, if you want to study teaching, there won't be funding for that. Mm -hmm. So what is your, 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 your take and what is the EFF's position when it comes to uh, qualifications? Are there qualifications that are more important than the others? I think let's start with funding. the madness of blatant demand. <laughs> it's total madness in yeah. the sense that if a qualification is not important, mm -hmm. we should have picked it up at the curriculum level. Mm -hmm. at the basic education level. Mm -hmm. So if you are saying teaching is not important currently in South Africa, when we have such a huge shortage of teachers, what are you implying? When we have graduates uh, who are teachers and they cannot be absorbed by schools, what are you implying? There's no qualification that is more important than the other. What is What raises eyebrows is you don't have doctors. Therefore, it means the government should prioritize or find a way of putting more money onto these uh, qualifications that are immediately needed in the country. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. You can't say you are not funding teachers, uh, students, because you feel that you have enough teachers, especially with the current conditions that we have of shortage of teachers, of overcrowding uh, of learners in classrooms, due to the fact that they don't have teachers, they don't have infrastructure and all of that. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no qualification that is more important than the other, mm -hmm. but there are qualifications that are immediately needed, desperately needed by the country, mm -hmm. because the country cannot afford to go outside to go and get skills or to get uh, uh, professionals from mm -hmm. outside when they can produce for themselves. Mm -hmm. What the government should be able to do is to identify these uh, uh, courses that are needed in the country to say let's put in more effort here so that we also go out and get skills because you you can produce doctors but if you don't take them out to the best countries mm -hmm. uh, that produce doctors if you don't take doctors here and take them to cuba to go and acquire skills and experience and come back and do the same here then there's nothing that you are doing but every now and then when we need doctors, we must go to Cuba and get doctors. And then after they've done whatever that they need to do here, they leave again. We are left with the same crisis. Uh, we are left desperate for doctors in the country because they, the government currently feels that uh, a doctor and a teacher and a mathematician is not important. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to produce tenderpreneurs. And tenderpreneurs you get where? On the streets. So they do not put efforts or invest in these uh, 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 qualifications because once you produce them, you then limit their chance and opportunity to go out and waste money of the state in an umbrella of saying we're going to get skills or experience from outside. Mm. When you have so many people who are willing, we've got young people who are willing to close the gaps and to close... Uh, the inequalities that are there, they are willing to study, they are willing to go to the different countries to acquire experience, to acquire more skills and come back and execute those uh, 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 experience or to come and disseminate the experience and the skills. Mm -hmm. uh, but the government is not doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so to say that there's going to be students or learners who are administered in the institutions of higher learning and you're not going to fund them when you did not stop it at a basic education level mm -hmm. is ridiculous mm -hmm. because if you don't need 
uh, teachers anymore. You should have picked it up there. You should not have then redirected the learning or the education system to producing more teachers. The reason why a lot are going to say they are teachers, they are logistics uh, practitioners and all of that is because their knowledge ended there. There was no way a person can opt or want or aspire to be a doctor mm -hmm. when they don't have facilities to see what a doctor would do. Because when you leave high school mm -hmm. and you go to institutions of higher learning and you look at the, pro the prospectors, you need to know what you want. No one is going to invest their time in, in a university to yeah. tell you, uh, this is what you must do, this is what you must not do. Because so also a, they don't know where you come from. Yeah. So in a nutshell, what you need to do or the education system should be automatically by default. Mm -hmm. If a certain qualification is not going to be funded, therefore it shouldn't be in the curriculum. It shouldn't be in the curriculum. Um, I don't think that is possible because mm -hmm. you don't know what is going to happen to the growth of oh, the country yes. in the next years. Yes. Uh, but hence I'm saying mm -hmm. you then put more, you invest more in other uh, professions, mm -hmm. in other courses, looking at what is needed currently and what, if you are in a responsible government, you should know what you would need in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. what you would need in the next 20 years. If you are a futuristic government, you should know, if you are saying you are going to expand the healthcare facility systems, mm -hmm. or the healthcare system, mm -hmm. uh, how many doctors you would need in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. and therefore how many doctors you would need to produce mm -hmm. within that time. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't cut out certain uh, courses or you can't say you must stop mm -hmm. uh, being a teacher, you must stop going to study being a maybe business admin. We have enough of that, yes. Mm -hmm. And maybe limit the space, mm -hmm. but you can't take them into the institution and not fund them because they're already absorbed by the institution. Mm -hmm. uh, so there should be also a way of limiting or recrafting space to say, in this university, we're going to take more doctors than we take sure. business study uh, students. Mm -hmm. In this institution, we're going to take um, maybe civil engineers more than we're going to take logistics studies uh, students mm -hmm. so that you see where the money must go mm -hmm. and where the investment must go as a country. Mm -hmm. So what the EFF is going to do is not only abolishing IEB exams, but of course also abolishing uh, tenders. NFSS has been marred by allegations of um, uh, corruption, even including the Minister of uh, Higher Education, mm -hmm. Bain Zimane, that he allegedly received kickbacks. But when you look at the administration of uh, NFSS uh, when it comes to allowance, allowance, issuing allowances or funding students. It's not flawless, but we hear of stories of corruption uh, that is uh, happening there at NFSS. What do you think needs to happen in, 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 in a scheme that has got so much budget. I think it's 40 billion per year, per mm -hmm. annum, but still it's failing to uh, fulfill its mandate. A national funding scheme like NSFAS mm -hmm. cannot be at the hands of individuals. Mm -hmm. um, but also with the current government, even if you put it solely in the hands of government, it's going to fail. Um, you need a funding scheme should be a department in government that just focuses on that. But as and when allowances need to be done, you go and pick titles and say, no, come, we're going to give you this tender to, you pay people to give out money when state is supposed to have established enough capacity, mm -hmm. build enough capacity for that kind of administration to happen. So if you do not want the issues of corruption, if you do not want the issues of tenders, a funding scheme like NSFAS should be in the hands of the state mm -hmm. with permanent people to account for it. Not check in, check out that we see in NFSAS. If you yeah. say money was lost today, you can put in 21 million in or 1 million in a student's uh, account. Uh, the person who mm -hmm. has put in that money 
doesn't get held accountable, but the child must be held accountable because, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that scheme has to be in the hands of the state and it needs to be a state that has built enough capacity and has put in genuine people whose job is exactly that, to go and ensure that as many students in the institutions of higher learning are funded. Mm -hmm. So if you take a person who knows that if I cut 10, it means the money for 10 goes to the commission, mm -hmm. then it's something else. But that is the danger of putting in a middle person oh. between an institution and a state. If you know the importance of that money and the impact of that funding, yeah. a state is going to build enough capacity and ensure that that administration is done by the state. By all indications, uh, Brain Zimande's uh, days are numbered. Yeah, oh, definitely. <laughs> Not just him. Yeah. The party that he that come that he comes from, yeah. the government that he's executing now, mm -hmm. uh, he's part of the executive, and therefore the government of the ANC's days are really numbered. I think it's eighty what four days, eighty mm -hmm. days 80 to three, go, eighty yeah. three days to yeah. go now mm -hmm. to elections. Yeah. I think they have really showed the people of South Africa who they really are. Mm -hmm. and from all the times and the chances that they were given, they've continuously failed. Mm -hmm. And if you fail and play with the future of the young people of a country, it means you as a person uh, are a criminal yourself because it means you have capacity of crushing and collapsing the state mm -hmm. if you are not going to invest in those who are going to take the country forward and who are going to ensure that the government of the day continues to function. Mm -hmm. mm. The EFF has on many occasions demonstrated its readiness to, to govern. You look at students who have benefited from uh, the EFF. Now we have produced pilots yes. through the EFF, yes. a pilot program that shows the readiness and the capability of mm. the EFF. And we have done so while we are not in government uh, uh, you know, so to speak. Now, that shows that beyond the 29th of May 2024, the EFF mm -hmm. surely can do more to yeah. empower students. It's going to do more. I think the little that the EFF has been doing is a demonstration of what an EFF government will be mm -hmm. like. And it, it is important for a political party like the EFF to demonstrate uh, what a government like the EFF would look like. Mm -hmm. especially with all these other opposition, majority of opposition parties gunning against the EFF. It means they somehow also uh, have sit in a corner of, and have seen the efforts of the EFF and the capacity of the EFF. You look at the DA, it's the second poli biggest political party in the country, mm -hmm. but what has it done except what it has done for Cape Town in the Western Cape and not even the neighboring townships mm -hmm. that surrounds Cape Town alone. So the EFF goes to different places in different communities. There has been an impact, a positive impact that the EFF has done. You mm -hmm. go to a school, you find a school with no water. The mm -hmm. EFF ensures that if the municipality doesn't come and open water, the, the government of the EFF, part, uh, polit, uh, public representatives of the EFF, they make sure there's a board, there's a borehole. They make sure that there's electricity there. Wherever communities need the EFF, the EFF is always there. And I think it's also the good work of the public representatives of the EFF understanding what its political party mm -hmm. uh, wants to see itself when they're when they're in government. I think public representatives of the EFF have a better understanding of where the EFF wants to see itself. Mm -hmm. And that is why they do work of the organization so effortlessly. Mm -hmm. A public rep of the EFF knows that when it's January and it's back to school, chances of a particular community not having, or children not having school shoes are very high, looking at the conditions of that area. And therefore, that is why you would find during January times and February, there's going to be a lot of back-to-school campaigns. We clean schools. Mm -hmm. uh, we go and donate a uniform 
we donate school shoes, we donate dignitary packages. Mm-hmm. That is because those are the things that needs to happen under the EFF government. And public representatives currently of the EFF understands that. They understand that it's a mandate of the EFF and it needs to be demonstrated now so that when the EFF gets in power, uh, it does not become a new or foreign thing to happen. They know that what the EFF mandated us to do Mm -hmm. is exactly what's going to happen when they're in government. Mm -hmm. And of course, the EFF makes uh, education fashionable you know, yeah. at every turn. Mm-hmm. And uh, under the EFF government, uh, of course, higher education is going to see a new direction when it comes to uh, students' access to uh, funding, mm-hmm. uh, students. I mean, there are many uh, abandoned buildings that can be turned into uh, student accommodations. Mm. Uh, you look at here in Johannesburg, there are a lot of hijacked buildings that can be uh, used as uh, student accommodation. So clearly the EFF has got this covered. Yeah. Um, you know, I always say the manifesto of the EFF is like a master plan mm-hmm. of a properly functioning government. Mm-hmm. Um, because especially with regards to education. It Mm -hmm. does not only fight for students uh, to be absorbed Mm -hmm. um, by in the academic space, but it also portrays that with its leadership itself. Mm -hmm. The EFF now forces uh, leaders of the EFF to study because you can't fight for a student if you have never been a student. Uh, You can't fight battles of students if you have never been part of those battles yourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, So the higher education system uh, and space is going to take a total 10 once the EFF gets in government Mm -hmm. Um, in a sense that the EFF does not only want to educate people, but they want these students and these young people to be part and to be absorbed in the economy of the country. Mm -hmm. So part of the EFF plan, the EFF's plan is, when you are in institutions of higher learning, there must be an, an, a relationship mm-hmm. between the different industries and the institutions of higher learning. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't then say, go and study, and when you have to do practicals, you're on your own. There has to be a close relationship between industries and institutions of higher learning, mm-hmm. knowing that immediately after you are done and you need to do your practicals, this is where you go. Mm-hmm. It does not become two different processes that must be done. Mm-hmm. Once you are done, you have graduated, you know there is already a database to say there are certain in, uh, institutions that have this mm-hmm. uh, group of young people. They are about to finish. If we're going to have employment here, these are the people that we're going to take. Mm-hmm. So there must be a smooth process between leaving institutions of higher learning and getting into the space, into the corporate space. Mm-hmm. The in- industries must be ready. Um, for students from institutions of higher learning. Mm -hmm. So the EFF, that's what the EFF wants to do. Um, We don't only want to create or to produce employees. Mm -hmm. We want to produce bosses as well. Yes. Uh, We want people to be able to start their own businesses. The Mm -hmm. EFF is willing to invest in young people who want to start businesses. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not all of us are going to be doctors. Not all of us are going to be mathematicians and all of that. Therefore, all the industries Mm -hmm. that are going to or that contribute Mm -hmm. to the big chunk of the economy of the country needs to be invested in. And we need to identify uh, different individuals who are willing to step into that space Mm -hmm. and assist the government in ensuring that the country does not only operate on autopilot, um, but it has a pure plan, a clear plan, Mm-hmm. of what happens Wh- when you move from here where do you go mm-hmm. uh, when you exit on this door which door do you need to go into uh, and so that you don't find young people wanting and uh, not knowing whether they are going or coming mm-hmm. in terms of their futures because that also has a very negative impact mm-hmm. on government itself yeah uh, when you have a lot of young people who don't know what they want to be or who have studied and they don't have employment and they don't have means mm-hmm. of living then it sends a very wrong message uh, to 
your competitors as well. Governments are competing. But if you are flat-footed and your young people and your graduates are in every robot that you pass, uh, it sends a very clear picture of what kind of government mm -hmm. you are. So the EFF is definitely going to ensure that young people are not only absorbed in institutions of higher learning, but there is going to be a huge creation of jobs so that the conditions of the country can be changed by those who have yeah. just entered. Uh, mm -hmm. Once one graduate in a family gets employment, there's five, six uh, people in a household yeah. that gets taken care of. Yeah. And therefore, we will not find ourselves being desperate to give people 350s mm -hmm. to go and buy a 1,000 rand worth groceries with. Mm -hmm. mm. We, of course, when we talk about employment, the EFF uh, has seen a gap when it comes to uh, the manufacturing industry. We can't even manufacture or produce a toothpick. Mm. But now the EFF wants to uh, obviously create create jobs mm -hmm. through uh, manufacturing our own car here in South Africa, having our own uh, cell phones. Mm -hmm. How is that going to be rolled out? I mean, uh, it only makes sense to mm -hmm. produce final products that we get from other countries because we mm -hmm. are the producers of the raw materials oh. that is used, yeah. right? So you take timber from South Africa mm -hmm. and then you take it elsewhere so that they create or mm -hmm. they they make toothpicks mm -hmm. and then you buy the same toothpick as a, as a final product. Mm -hmm. And that is why also the cost of living is so expensive because we buy what we produce and we will not also get it at a price that is reasonable mm -hmm. because there is, it goes through a process. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're also very lenient with our raw materials. I think we're close to just giving them away. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't find, we don't really find value mm -hmm. um, in our raw materials. That is why it's so easy for us to give it away. Mm -hmm. um, so, the EFF wants to create, and it's part of the cardinal pillars of the EFF, mm -hmm. um, that we must create massive industrial capacity mm -hmm. as, a, as a government. Um, why? Because so many factories have closed down. And if you look at how many people were employed at mm -hmm. the time when we used to have factories, it's a huge number mm -hmm. of people. Uh, and then at the time, it was the economy was able to revolve uh, because so many people were absorbed. Mm -hmm. um, but not only that, we were producing our own things. Mm -hmm. uh, look at the textile industry now. The South African government must go and get a material mm -hmm. outside. Everything is exported. Mm -hmm. um, and that becomes a crisis for the country because it means everything that you use here we must buy mm -hmm. and not buy at a reasonable price. Um, but the raw materials are done here, are produced here. Mm -hmm. So it only makes sense that you don't take steel to Germany to, to manufacture a car mm -hmm. when you can go out, acquire skills, or bring those skills here to say you are going to be here for three years. Mm -hmm. And what you are going to be doing is to be transferring skills to the South Africans, uh, to the South African students who have studied this and that mm -hmm. so that ultimately the country is able to uh, produce these products themselves. So under the EFF government, we are going to produce a car. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very reasonable. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, that principal of the CIC will be able to buy a car. <laughs> a <new> car. <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. buy a new car. But I think um, the take on that of producing... Mm -hmm. Um, automobiles, mm -hmm. uh, mobile phones, and mm -hmm. all of that is precisely because we the country cannot afford to export everything. Yes, especially with a cunt, with a government of the EFF that is going to be so well capacitated mm -hmm. and established. Uh, the reason why the EFF is investing in education is because you are going to absorb the same people who you have invested in to come and then put. Uh, their impact or contribute to the economy. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at them, these things are interrelated. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So you move from here. Once you invest in education, then it means you are, go you are going to be able to produce mm -hmm. what the country has never been able to produce. Mm -hmm. And once you produce that, then it means you are then able to compete in the, economic, in the global economic world. Uh, once you do that as a country, then it means Germany must now come and buy cars oh, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Germany must now come buy parts here because we produce the steel. We are going to be producing the parts. Therefore, they must be the ones that buy the parts from here. They can still uh, produce their BMWs and all of mm -hmm. that. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But they will be getting the parts from South Africa because we are the producers of the raw materials. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're going to be producing the parts as well. Mm -hmm. And that that shows clearly the commitment uh, mm -hmm. by the EFF to champion the class struggle, the class struggle, obviously, mm -hmm. between the rich and the, the poor. poor. You know, the funny thing is that Africa is poor with its own minerals. Mm -hmm. And mind you, the people, including the Oppenheimers, who are the richest here in South Africa, are not only rich because, well, they come from, um, you know, Western countries that are well off. Mm -hmm. uh, they are rich through our own uh, minerals. So the EFF is the custodian of, uh, you know, ownership of means of production mm -hmm. to empower the poor so that we have access to, uh, you know, buying land or rather renting land or uh, getting a loan at uh, a reasonable interest rate. Mm -hmm. So that is what the, the, the people of South Africa need to know and why they should be able to vote for the EFF because the EFF wants to emancipate them economically. Now, when we look at um, uh, the in development or research development, mm -hmm. the EFF is very clear mm -hmm. that uh, raw minerals will be processed here. Mm -hmm. And also the people who are unemployed here in South Africa are the ones who are going to be employed. And that obviously is going to contribute massively to the GDP yes. of the country, which is currently, uh, 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 you know, uh, declining. So if we may take over, in fact, we're going to take over government. Yeah, definitely. The 29th of May <laughs> elections. What should the people of South Africa expect? So on the 29th of, South of, of May, mm -hmm. uh, when South Africans go out and vote, mm -hmm. Uh, when you put an X next to the EFF, you'll be putting an X next to employment. You'll be putting an X next to the ending of load shading. Mm -hmm. You'll be putting an X next to education, free quality, decolonized education. Mm -hmm. uh, you will be putting an X to the dignity of mm -hmm. your family, of you as an individual mm -hmm. coming back because you will be putting an X also to land, mm -hmm. to access to land. When you say you process raw materials here, mm -hmm. uh, it's very funny because even the food that we eat now, we produce them, but we don't eat the grades, the best of the best grades. Uh, the grades must go out there. It makes money, but as part of food security, we do have as a country the capacity of producing mm -hmm. the best grades for everyone. You know, So the 29th of May, we say is going to be our 1994. Mm -hmm. Because in 1994, our parents and grandparents were promised a lot of things. And part of that, one of the reasons why our parents and grandparents believed so much in the ANC was because the ANC made a promise and said they are going to educate their children. Mm -hmm. And therefore they thought to themselves, this is an end to poverty. If my child and my grandchild gets education, it means they're going to get employment. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore it means my poverty or the chain of poverty from back home has come to an end. And that was just a dream that they sold to our people. Mm -hmm. So voting for the EFF on the 29th of May, you are voting for what was promised and what was not given. Uh, education, employment, load shading. Uh, you say now that learners are not doing so well in public schools. That's because... Mm -hmm. From 2020, from 2022 up until now, they've had mm. to study in candles. Mm. They had to go prepare for examinations in candles. Mm -hmm. So you will be putting a stop to that. 
mm-hmm. you will be putting a stop to unemployed youth loitering around the streets, losing hope uh, for themselves and their families. So that is what a vote of the EFF will be doing. It will be instilling hope in the mm-hmm. lives of our people. Mm-hmm. It will be instilling a futuristic view of what me and you will be and what our own children and grandchildren mm-hmm. will be in the future. Mm-hmm. Because every generation must lay its own foundation. Each generation out of relative obscurity um, mm-hmm. has a mission, uh, whether to fulfill it mm-hmm. or... Okay or to betray it. Mm-hmm. And therefore, I think it is part now, it is time now that the current generations uh, come together and take a stance because we have allowed mediocre to happen for too long. Far too long, yeah. Uh, we have allowed to be undignified for too long. We have allowed ourselves to be mm-hmm. uh, taken for granted. Uh, you know, people need to know, South Africans need to know the value and the power that comes with an X on the ballot. It's not about which political party was the first to be voted in mm-hmm. uh, out of the apartheid government. Uh, it's not about which political leaders were there at the time and which political parties they belonged to. Mm-hmm. It's about who has a vision for black people now, who has a vision for a better South Africa. Uh, the EFF, even in its list, the president said there has to be a race. We need to cover race. We need to cover geographic mm-hmm. spread and all of that. Mm-hmm. And we have done that. Uh, when we say black people, we are not necessarily say white people must go home. And if there's a white people, that there's a white person that feels that the EFF's intention is to chase away black people, mm-hmm. it means that white person uh, has not sat down and made a, an analysis of what EFF wants to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the reality is that the EFF wants a South Africa where everyone is going to be as important mm-hmm. and everyone is going to know that they've got space and everyone is going to have access mm-hmm. to basic things mm-hmm. uh, that everyone should have. Uh, it shouldn't be a matter of color, mm-hmm. whether you're black or white, to have water. Mm-hmm or to have access to electricity, mm-hmm. or to housing, yeah. or to land. Yeah. So an X uh, for the EFF is going to be an X to access to land, mm-hmm. is going to be an X to access to education, to employment, mm-hmm. um, a, a, a huge influx of young people being yeah. employed. Yeah. Um, but also we've got grants, we've mm-hmm. got old age grants, we've got child foster care mm-hmm. grants. Uh, it's a myth that those grants will not be there under the EFF government. Yes. And I think those who use that as an excuse to go and oh, yeah. decampaign and I think the for EFF. The ANC, that is their campaigning mm. ticket, yes. especially for the old. Yes, they it's, think it's, that the grant will you be know, taken away. It's total madness to, to, for a government to go and say the opposition is going to get rid of this because the grants are grants of the ANC. Mm-hmm. Part of their campaign is when they speak to old people, they tell them, if you don't vote for the ANC, you're not going to get your grants anymore because the grants were introduced by the ANC, which is mm-hmm. not true. Mm-hmm. The grants are still going to be there. In fact, the EFF says that the grants that are currently being uh, 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 being given to our people, they do not meet what they need to buy. Mm-hmm. So they don't meet the expectation. Uh, the EFF wants to double grants. Mm-hmm. They want to increase these grants, considering the fact that there is so much uh, that a grandmother does, a grandmother mm-hmm. that takes care of three, four grandchildren with 2,000 rands is not enough. Not. Child foster grant, uh, grant is not enough. Mm-hmm. And therefore the EFF commits to uh, increasing these grants mm-hmm. uh, and ensuring that our people are able mm-hmm. to uh, yeah. meet the standard of living. Mm-hmm. And if you, you, you look at the efficacy or the practi- practicability mm-hmm of uh, free education and free health care. Look at Cuba, for an ex- for instance. Yes. It's thriving and uh, it's producing the best of the best, uh, you know, medical doctors. We Even even during COVID-19, mm-hmm. we imported, we had to uh, rely on Cuba for such. So the EFF, of course, is going to make education free, free health care on a 24-hour uh, basis. Now, as we wind up, uh, as a public uh, representative of the EFF, mm-hmm. 
Uh, are you pursuing any studies to make uh, education more fashionable? Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I am pursuing. I've just graduated in December. I was doing municipal finance mm. uh, management mm-hmm. uh, because after I seen, before I became a member of parliament, I was a member of council. I was a councillor mm-hmm. and I served in the municipal public accounts. A committee mm-hmm. and then that made me realize just how important it is for mm-hmm. you to deploy mm-hmm. people who understand uh, the usage of money and not just usage of money but to enable uh, regulations a mm-hmm. uh, you know an act municipal finance act mm-hmm. teaches a lot how to use money how to produce and to make revenue mm-hmm. uh, for a municipality so that you don't only rely on national treasury to yes, give money absolutely. to municipalities. And I think that's part of the reasons why municipalities are collapsing mm-hmm. because they solely rely on national treasury. But you need to find ways of uh, generating revenue so that service delivery does not collapse mm-hmm. at your hands mm-hmm. as a government. Because when you are at a local government, there's no one who waits for uh, Godongwane to come and give yeah. money. Yeah. When they look at you, they want service delivery. And mm-hmm. service delivery, people must get. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I have that. I have a diploma in logistics management. Mm-hmm. I'm busy with my BTEC now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm also looking at registering mm-hmm. uh, for another qualification yeah. just after elections because it's, it's hectic times yeah. now. Once we have delivered the EFF to government, I'm definitely <laughs> yeah. enrolling yeah. for another I must say, I must say uh, that, you know, Commissar, being at the EFF or in the EFF without uh, studying, it's a, it's a serious price. So I had to register. <laughs> I'm back to school as well. <laughs> as we speak, yeah, I'm it's a It's a requirement student. <laughs> now to be a public representative and to lead yeah. in the structures of yeah. the EFF. Yeah. So, and I think it's, it's, it's really mm-hmm. a great initiative for the yeah. EFF to do that because uh, look at what the impact that it has done since the mm-hmm. e, the EFF has put those mm-hmm. as the recommendations to say, um, if you want to lead in the mm-hmm. EFF, you must have mm-hmm. some form of education, you know, yeah. education yeah. Um, so that you also get to understand broadly mm-hmm. why the EFF has put these uh, uh, commitments yes. and why the EFF fights for certain things. Yeah, and the EFF know? always does what says it will do. Yeah. And we're taking inspiration. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not a public rep, but mm-hmm. I've taken inspiration. I've gone back to school. I'm studying. That's great. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so looking forward to graduating <laughs> as well. <laughs> so yeah, on that note, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Commissar, thank you very much for making time and uh, making sense of the EFF manifesto mm-hmm. on education and uh, research development. And uh, we really look forward to um, uh, the 29th of May, 2024. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Titus, for having me. And uh, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity. I hope mm-hmm. that we all go out on mm-hmm. the 29th of May mm-hmm. to vote for the EFF and mm-hmm. vote for change. Mm-hmm. Because that day, is going to be the 1994 of this current generation. Thank Mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you very much for making time. And uh, we have come to the end of today's show, ladies and gentlemen. In case you want to familiarize yourself with uh, the contents of this booklet, the EFF uh, uh, Manifesto, it's easily accessible on the EFF website at uh, effonline.org. You will get to know. Uh, what the EFF's plan of action is all about uh, ahead of the uh, 2024 general elections that, of course, is going to take place on the 29th of May. So I urge you to uh, make a change, stand up, and uh, make sure that you vote for economic freedom. My name is Titus Tungu. Until we meet again, good day. Kanimamba. Stand up, South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run, South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a covert thing.